Hi, in this video I would like to describe a slide of a human fetus, specifically a sagittal section through the body of the fetus obtained from an extrauterine pregnancy, pregnancy outside the uterus. Extrauterine pregnancy is a life-threatening condition. Basically, the fetus has no chance to develop and survive in the environment outside the uterus, and it's a great threat to the mother's life. The fetus is of anatomical age 8 plus 4, that means 8 weeks and 4 days, which is already after the embryonic period, so we are talking about a fetus, not an embryo. The crown rub length of such very young fetus is about 27 to 31 millimeters, and its weight does not exceed 3 grams. In the terms of gestational age, which means the time from the onset of the last menstrual bleeding, it will be a pregnancy of 10 plus 4, that means 2 weeks more. Cranially, we can observe the thoracic region, where I begin by describing the respiratory system. We can see a sagittal section of the trachea with cross sections of developing rings of hyaline cartilage in its wall. We proceed to the area below, where we can see branching of the bronchi and reach the lungs. We distinguish four stages of lung development, namely the pseudoglandular, canalicular, terminal sac and the alveolar stage. In this case, we can see the pseudoglandular stage, the first stage of lung development, which lasts until the 16th week of fetal development. We can see a developing pulmonary parenchyma and branching bronchi and bronchioles, resembling a glands. Therefore, this stage got its name. Respiratory bronchioles are not developed, so these lungs are not yet capable of exchanging gases. Lungs are developed as an outpouching of the primitive gut, called tracheobronchial diverticle. Epithelium is derived from this endodermal diverticle, while other structures of the wall such as cartilage, smooth muscles, connective tissue and visceral pleura are derived from splanchnic mesoderm. Close to the lungs, we can find a section through the heart ventricle. Its wall and trabecules are formed by immature cardiomyocytes that are already capable of contraction. The heart begins to develop as one of the first organs in the cardiogenic zone during third week. By this time, the formation of the interventricular septum and outflow tract should be completed and the heart should pump blood to the body. There are visible large vessels around the heart such as the superior vena cava and the aortic arch. Ribs form the wall of the thoracic cavity. We can see them as hyaline cartilages which are interconnected by skeletal intercostal muscles. We can observe developing muscles at various places in our slide. The basic unit of a skeletal muscle is the muscle fiber. It's a syncytion that is formed by the fusion of several cells called myoblasts. Merging myoblasts form myotubes, which can be seen in the fetus. These are cross-sections of myotubes where we can see the eosinophilic cytoplasm and centrally located nucleus. In longitudinal sections of other developing muscles, we can see their tubular appearance with many nuclei in the center. The uppermost and largest cartilaginous structure in the anterior thoracic wall is the sternum. The hypertrophy of its chondrocytes is the sign of the ongoing enchondral ossification. There is also a thymus located dorsally to the sternum. The reticular epithelium of the thymus arises from the third pharyngeal pouch endoderm and T lymphocytes, which acquire immunocompetence in the thymus, enter it from the blood islets where they arise. We are moving dorsally in our slide. Behind the trachea, we can see a small part of the esophagus with developing squamous stratified non-carotinizing epithelium which is from endoderm of a primitive gut and with a fine layer of muscle. Further behind, there are cartilaginous structures which are the future vertebrae. They are derived from paraaxial mesoderm, which forms somites in the process of segmentation. 
there are spinal ganglia in proximity of the vertebrae. We can observe nerve cell bodies, pericaria, with their light active nuclei and large visible nucleoli, as well as processes exiting and entering the ganglion. Ganglia in general are derived from neural crest. Further, let us focus on the abdominal region of the fetal body. The largest organ which takes up a big portion of the abdominal cavity is the liver, which develops as an outpouching of the primitive gut, hepatic diverticle. It's located under the diaphragm, which is this layer over here. Liver contains a huge number of developing hepatocytes, as well as islets of hematopoietic cells. Bone marrow will eventually take over the process of hematopoiesis, but it needs time to develop, as bones are not yet fully developed. We can find the branches of hepatic portal vein, the proper hepatic artery, and the common hepatic duct in the hilum of the liver, called porta hepatis. There is also a section through the gallbladder on some slides, which is visible as larger cavity lined with simple columnar epithelium. There are both longitudinal and transverse sections of intestinal loops located below the liver. Intestinal mucosa forms villi covered by simple columnar epithelium, which means that these are sections of the small intestine. We can also see mesentery, the suspending structure of the intestinal loops. As you can see, we can find intestinal loops even outside of the fetal body. This phenomenon is called the physiological umbilical hernia. Now you are probably wondering, why does this happen? Well, you can see that the liver is quite huge and takes up an extensive portion of the abdominal cavity. So the intestinal loops get pushed out of the body. This happens in the sixth week of development. The hernia is reposed in the 10th to 11th week as the abdomen expands and creates more space for intestines. Around this time, the gut loses its connection to the yolk sac. Let us have a look inside the retroperitoneal space, where we can find a kidney and a suprarenal gland. Adrenal glands are rather large at the beginning of the fetal development, due to extensive growth of primitive fetal cortex but they do not gain as much size in later stages. If we have a closer look, we can distinguish large eosinophilic cells in the center forming primitive cortex and smaller cells surrounding primitive cortex forming secondary, definitive cortex. Both are derived from the coelomic epithelium from lateral somatic mesoderm in the close proximity of the mesentery. Primitive cortex will disintegrate and neural crest cells will later migrate to the center and form future medulla, which is not visible yet. Secondary cortex will then divide into three zones, zona glomerulosa, fasciculata and zona reticularis. Urinary system develops from three subsequent systems which are arranged craniocaudally. Pronephros, mesonephros and metanephros all arise from intermediate mesoderm and are linked by the mesonephric duct of Wolf. On our specimen, we can find a metanephric kidney that has ascended from the pelvic region to its final position. We can see its ranculization, that means visible division into lobes. We recognize the renal corpuscles and developing nephron tubules. The ureteric bud, emerging from the mesonephric duct, gives rise to the ureter, renal pelvis and calyces, including the collecting ducts. We can see the pelvis on the specimen. The border between metanephros and mesonephros thus lies between the distal tubules of the nephrons and the collecting ducts at the level of connecting tubule. The remnants of mesonephros and its duct can be found near the testis as rudimentary paradidymis, aberrant ductules, and appendix epididymidis, and near ovary, uterine tube, and uterus as epiphoron, paraphoron, and longitudinal duct, respectively, 
as the developing gonad is located nearby and also derived from intermediate mesoderm. Indeed, the mesonephros also gives rise to a part of the male genital system, specifically ductus deferens, duct of epididymis, which are from the mesonephric duct, and efferent ductules of the testes forming from the mesonephric tubules. The primary medullary cords, formed by proliferation of the superficial salomic epithelium from the lateral mesoderm, give rise to the convoluted seminiferous tubules, straight tubules and reta testis. The primordial germ cells from the wall of the yolk sac, which got there from epiblast, migrate to the seminiferous tubules and develop into germ cells that can be found there. The primary medullary cords lose contact with the superficial epithelium and tunica albuginea, a layer of future thick, dense collagen connective tissue covering the gonad. Now let us move to the pelvic region. There are two separate cavities which were formed in the process of cloacal division by urorectal septum. The ventral cavity is called the urogenital sinus, while the dorsal cavity is termed the anorectal canal. Urogenital sinus gives rise to the urinary bladder and urethra. Two paired structures are connected to the urogenital sinus on both sides, ureter and mesonephric duct. There is visible only a part of ureter in our section. There is one more structure which we can see in the section. It can be seen near the physiological umbilical hernia and in, it is a developing extremity. Connective tissue is developed from lateral plate mesoderm and skeletal muscles, as all skeletal muscles of the fetus are derived from the somites, from the paraaxial mesoderm. There are two big bones developing here, I hope you know their name. Thanks for watching, I hope you have enjoyed the video. If you are interested in more embryological videos, let us know in the comment section below. Like the video and subscribe to our channel for more histology and pathology content.